Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to church. Welcome to New Life Church here in Hatchet Lake, Nova Scotia. My name's Darren, pastor here. So glad that you've chosen to tune in this morning. This morning is a little different. If you've been tuning in to some other uh, YouTube videos, uh, this morning we are, we are live at 10 o'clock. And so uh, you're not able to fast forward because this is our premiere uh, happening at 10 if you're tuning in. Then you'll also see that, that to your right uh, on the screen, there should be a place where you can make comments that you can uh, perhaps even connect. Uh, you can talk in church and uh, with one another. So uh, something we're trying this week. Hope it goes well. But um, wonderful verse to start us off with this morning here when Jesus says, come to me, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Let's pray as we begin this morning. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to gather even in this format. God, we pray that uh, over this next hour, uh, Lord, that by your spirit, you would, you would encourage us, that, that you would teach us, uh, Lord, that you would uh, continue the work that you've begun in our lives. And so we ask your blessing upon, upon um, this hour and uh, help us to hear your voice, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as always, it's great to have, uh, to have you volunteer uh, for music and for worship. And so I want to thank the Vokies this morning for bringing us a special selection now in worship.
thank you, thank you, Vokies. That was great and uh, great to see you. A couple weeks ago, we started sharing our favorite verses uh, or a verse that's been really significant for you during these uh, days of, of isolation. We did uh, uh, quite a number of you last week and thank you for those who contributed. Uh, we've got a few more this week and uh, we're gonna look at, look at them here now, but I've got a couple that just came in on email and so let me read them here to you now. Uh, uh, Carolyn, her favorite verse, uh, she, she tells us, it's Psalm 59 verse 17. That says, you are my strength. I sing praise to you. God, you are my fortress, my God on whom I can rely. And Angelica uh, sent in Isaiah 43 verse one. But now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name and you are mine. Those are great verses, and now let's listen to let's listen to a couple more. Hi everybody, Sam here. Hi littles, I miss you very much. My verse that is keeping me going these days is Psalms um, 55, number 22. When I was little, I knew it as a song. The words go, "Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and He shall sustain thee." He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. I knew it as a song, and it was, I will cast all my cares upon you. I will lay all of my burdens down at your feet. And any time I don't know what to do, I will cast all my cares upon you. Now, I'm sorry I didn't sing it. I'm not in my Sunday school class. Um, but that verse is keeping me going right now because there's a lot going on, and I can't wear it, but he can because he's got big, big shoulders, right? Our God is so strong, he can take it. I'm also reading a book, Worry Less, Pray More. And one in here is also from Psalm, Psalm 77, 19. Your road led through the sea, your pathway through the mighty waters, a pathway no one knew was there. You led your people along that road like a flock of sheep with Moses and Aaron as their shepherds. God is with us every day and every night and every step of the way. Don't ever forget it, everybody. Love you all. Hello, friends. I'm Janet. My favorite verse is my a go-to verse. Being blessed with a life, there are things that arise that can be very troubling, challenging, confusing, hurtful, fearful, threatening, to name just a few. So in this verse, God reminds me of who he is and then gives me a promise beyond myself, an answer as I follow through with him. The verse is in Jeremiah 33 verses 2 and 3. This is what the Lord says. He who made the earth, the Lord who formed it and established it, the Lord is his name. Call to me, in brackets, Janet, and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. I found this to be so true as I follow after Jesus in hearing this as his word to me. So looking back and presently, I can say he has been faithful. He continues to reveal his answers. I can depend on him and I can rest in the Lord. So thank you, Lord. And thank you, Lord, for Pastor Darren and all of you virtually. Um, virtually see you soon. Hi guys, Jan here. Um, I'm doing a video on my favorite verse or verses speaking to me and certainly through this time of COVID-19, time of isolation, 
Um, I mean, I am saying Philippians 4, 13 a lot. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. <laughs> Trying to remind myself of that. And of course, Psalm 121, 1 and 2. Um, asking, you know, where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. That is wonderful reminders. And we don't ever have to worry or, um, you know, check God. Like he will do his part. The Holy Spirit will do what he is to do. Um, but it's ourselves. There's a, a verse throughout the years that has has rung true to me, and I've loved it. Um, it's Joshua 24:15. It's where Joshua is speaking to the people about, you know, whom whom will you choose to serve? Uh, you decide. And so it, uh, the last part of 15 says, "But for me is for me and my household we will serve the Lord." And it just reminds me of what my part is. You know, God will do his part, but what's my part? And that is my part, to choose to serve him. It is a choice. And sometimes it's easy to choose things when things are going really good. And maybe not as easy when we're going through these tough times. So it's just a reminder for me um, as we go through these times that it still holds true today as it did years and years ago when I committed my life to the Lord that it's still a choice and I need to choose to serve him. And um, that's where, again, I think I said this last time, that's where the joy is in, in serving him. And I do, I claimed that over my household since I first read that verse many, many years ago. That, But as for me and my, whole, my household, we will serve the Lord. I love you and miss you, bye. Thanks everybody who contributed, who passed on their favorite verse. And uh, it's just great to have to have you participating in this way. Well, this morning, today is today's Mother's Day. And so I uh, want to wish Happy Mother's Day to uh, all you moms out there, uh, grandmothers, aunts, um, whatever the family category. We just want to say, hope you have a great day. And we want to take a couple minutes now and, and just have a, a few minutes to pray, uh, not only for the moms, but to, to pray for to pray for all the women. I think that's a, an appropriate thing to do uh, on a day like today. So let's join together now in prayer. Let's, let's pray together. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you, uh, Lord, for, for uh, each other. And Lord, we just pause now to take a moment and just thank you in particular for women. Thank you for creating women. Thank you for those women of influence that are in each of our lives. And uh, Lord, we just uh, pause to, to ask your blessing, uh, Lord, up, upon those women, Lord, upon those women who are, who are carrying the responsibility of motherhood, of, of grandmotherhood. Uh, Father, we pray that you would strengthen them with daily strength. Uh, Father, we pray that you would just uphold them with the responsibilities and the, the burdens that they are, are carrying uh, here today. And so, Father, we, we thank you for them, but we pray that you would provide for them. Father, we thank you for, for those mother-like figures uh, in our lives, those who have had such a nurturing influence in, in our lives, uh, both past and present. And Father, we pray for those who are in such roles, of, of mother-like roles uh, to many others. And again, that you would, you would bless and strengthen them. Father, today we also think and, and, and are mindful of those that this day uh, can be a difficult day. Uh, Lord, we pray in particular for those who uh, are grieving uh, a loss of mother, an absence of a mother. And Father, we pray for your comfort, your strength to be upon them. Lord, that there would be, that there would be memories of good times that would bring comfort, that would help in a day such as this. Father, in the midst of, in the midst of brokenness, in the midst of sickness, in the midst of anxiety and worry, uh, Father, we pray that you would bring comfort, uh, Father, to to, to those women of, of, of all ages, God, that are, are carrying uh, such burdens. Father, we also think today, uh, Lord, those who are, who are on the front line 
uh, of, of battling, continuing to battle this COVID crisis. Father, we pray that you would give them endurance. Uh, Lord, as, as yet another week has gone by with these very unique conditions. And we continue to pray for our government leaders, uh, Lord, that those who are, who are continuing to make decisions, uh, Lord, day to day, uh, pray that you would strengthen them and uh, just continue to uphold them. Father, we ask for your, for, your, for your grace and your mercy upon us. We ask for your protection, uh, Lord, these days. Uh, Lord, we ask for endurance as we continue on in, in uh, what is almost becoming a new normal uh, here now uh, in, in, in month three of this isolation. Father, we pray that you would be preparing us for the next chapter. Be preparing us, Lord, that we would rise up and, and be uh, your church here in this, in this corner of the globe. Father, we pray that you would uh, just build anticipation, uh, Lord, for uh, what you are doing and will continue to do in our midst. And so, Lord, we just pray now as we turn to your word, we pray that uh, by your spirit, uh, you, would, you would help us to hear, uh, Lord, exactly what you would desire for us to hear this morning. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. All right. Hope you have your Bibles. Uh, you're going to need them this morning. Here we are. We're in week four of hard parables. But before we start, I was, I was cleaning out the car uh, a few days ago, and, and I, came across, I came across this. This is a, this is a warning that I, got, I forgot about. I got a, a while ago, uh, and, and maybe like some of you, uh, I've had a few of these. I've had a number of these, and I remember one, uh, one time I, I, in one stop, this is not a brag, but in one stop I got three warnings back when I lived in PEI, and uh, because we're on camera, I will not mention what happened, <laughs> not my finest moment, but uh, yeah, three, three warnings there, but you know, we get warnings, and um, and, and you can really, you can, when you get a warning, there's probably one of two reactions that you could get when you get a warning. You could go, man, I, I can't believe I got a warning. Uh, I can't believe the officer gave me that. He, they must have been having a bad day or, or they must be needing a, a quota that, that they would give me a warning for whatever. Uh, that's one possible response. The other one, would be to say, I got a warning and ah, I need to change. I need to stop when the stop sign says stop, not roll through it. I need to obey traffic signs or I need to not do what, I need to change. And a warning was a good thing. It's two possible reactions. You know, there's, there's warnings when you're driving. Uh, there's also warnings in the Bible. And Jesus sometimes gave warnings. And at times he told those warnings, uh, sometimes in the form of a parable. And so that's where we're going this morning as we continue on in week four of our series of hard parables. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 21. We're going to start at verse 33. We're going to be starting where we left off last week. If you were with us last week, we looked at a parable in Matthew 21. And, and so in verse 33, in verse 33, it starts, it, it starts out, um, listen to another parable. This is Jesus talking. And so he's going to tell another parable. Just remember, where is Jesus when he's saying this? Remember, he's at the temple, and he's talking to the, to the chief priests, to the religious leaders, and they've asked him a question. They've said, they've said, where do you get your authority? I mean, you're going around this temple like you, like you own the place. Where'd you get your authority? And Jesus answered them with a parable. 
And, and he talked about this father who had two sons. And he asked his sons to go work in a field. And eventually, both sons agreed to go. But only one son went. And Jesus likened that to two people, two kinds of people. Those who, who say they're following, those who say they're, they're under God's authority and do it. And then there's another group who says, who says it but doesn't go, who say they're under authority, but they live their lives contrary to that. There's no evidence, there's no, there's no proof that they're serving. There's no proof that they're living under God's authority. Well, that was the first parable. And if the first parable didn't, didn't make sense to those high priests, those religious leaders, uh, the second one here will. And it's not only going to make sense, uh, I think, to those religious leaders, but it's also going to grab our attention this morning. And, and I think grab it in a way that maybe it never has before. This is a powerful parable we're going to look at this morning. Let's read it. It starts in verse 33, and we're going down to the end of 46. So a bit of reading here. Let's start in verse 33. Jesus said, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, stoned a third. And then he sent other servants to them, more than the first time. And the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched end, they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the crop at harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. But they looked for a way to arrest him. But they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. Right. Did you notice? Did you notice in that, in that parable that, that, the, that the chief priests, that the Pharisees didn't immediately clue in that the parable was about them? But this this self-righteousness rises up in them and they go, they go, those, those, let's bring those wretches to a wretched end. Let, let's, let's unpack this parable for a minute. This parable was actually about the history of Israel from its inception to that present day. God is the landowner and he's the landowner who who, the landowner who set up his tenants for success, who gave them a, a wine press and protection. And God did the same for Israel. He gave them land. He gave them a, a, a promise of blessing. He gave them a law to follow, that if they followed that law, then that blessing, that promise of blessing could be realized. God set them up for success because he wanted them to prosper. He had expectations for them. And you think about it, the, 
the landowner had expectations for the tenants. He wanted them to produce fruit. Well, God also had expectations for Israel. And I think you can, I think you can capture, I think you can sum up these expectations that God had in, in, three, in three broad categories. I'm just gonna put them on the board here. Uh, three broad categories. I, I think one of those categories would be honor. God wanted them to honor him and him alone as God, to not serve any other gods. The second, second was to obey. He wanted them to obey that law that he gave them so his blessings could flow to them, so, so they would be in a place to receive that blessing, that, that God's plan, that God's desires for them could be unfolded. He wanted them to obey. And then thirdly, he wanted them to share him with the nations. That, that, that Remember the passage, that all the nations of the world would be blessed through them. He wanted them to live in such a way that, that, that they would be drawn. There'd be, there'd be no God like your God. And then the nations would be blessed, drawn to him. Well, if, uh, some of you know the story. You know, you know that Israel didn't honor God and God alone. That they, they served other gods at times. You know that they didn't, they didn't obey the word. In fact, uh, they added to that word. And, and, and you know that they didn't, uh, they didn't share with others. Uh, the, the, they didn't share, you say, the good news. They didn't share um, with other nations. That just didn't happen. Verse, verse 43 is key. Verse 43, uh, when Jesus is speaking to the religious leaders, he says, Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. Jesus is telling the religious leaders that the privileged role of serving, of, of caring in God's vineyard will be taken away from them. That, that, that no longer will it just be Jews, but there will be Jews and non-Jews now, or Gentiles are called. And, and Jesus is telling the future here. He's telling, describing the church and, and the empowering of, of the spirit in the church that the kingdom will be taken away from you and given to others. This is where we come into the story. That, 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 that you and I, that New Life Church, that other churches that would, that would testify Jesus as Lord, the church in Canada, church in the world, that, that you and I, that we are the replacement tenants in the parable that we're the replacement tenants and the expectations that the landowner had on the tenants, the expectations that God had on Israel are now on us to honor, to obey, and to share. If we had time, we could go into this. How, how, did, how did Israel get to this point? I mean, I mean, you could look at these two reference points. At, at their inception, they're started off, they're, they're, they're brought into this promised land. They're, 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 they've made this covenant with God that you will be our God, we will be your people, and we will serve you, and we will represent you well. That's how they start. And then it gets, it, it's now at this point, Jesus with these religious authorities, they don't even recognize that, that they're the ones the parable's about. They think that getting rid of Jesus is doing God a favor. And they no longer hear God's voice. How do you get, how does a person get, how does a nation get from, from this point down to this point? How do you drift that far? Well, here in this parable, there are three mistakes that Israel made. Three mistakes 
that we can make also. And so we're going to be looking at these three mistakes here this morning. That's, that's where we're heading this morning. That's the outline if you're taking notes. We're going to be spending our time now looking briefly at, at three mistakes from this parable that Israel made, leaning into some great uh, commentary, some great teaching from, uh, from a number of commentators here at this point. But, but let's look at these mistakes. We'll start with mistake number one. Mistake number one is that they mistook the grace of God as, as indifference or affirmation of how they're living. I'll say that again. That, that they mistook the grace of God as indifference or affirmation of how they're living. Just go back to the parable here for a minute and, and this first group of, of servants that come to the tenants. And, and, and what did the tenants do to that first group of servants? It says they beat them and they killed them. Now imagine, if you're a tenant at this point, you're nervous. You're nervous because what do you think the landowner's gonna do? The landowner is gonna come He's, he's going to come with an army. He's going to come, and, and at the very least, he's going to, to, to evict you. And probably something worse. But the landowner does nothing. The landowner doesn't come. And the tenants are there thinking to themselves, well, maybe it's, maybe it's not a big deal. Uh, Maybe we don't have to produce. We don't have to, to bring a harvest. Maybe he doesn't care. You see, God's grace, God's grace, the landowner's grace, what does he do? He sends a second group. He sends more servants. It says even, he even sends his son. And what do, the, what do the tenants do? They kill them as well. And that's, a, that's an obvious reference Jesus is making to what's going to happen to him. Sometimes we misunderstand God's grace. We can misunderstand God's grace. We're, 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 we're doing something, we're, we're, living, we're living on our own authority, we're doing something that is obviously not in God's keeping God's desires for us. And, and then we go, well, God didn't punish me. It seems as though God's okay with it. It seems like God's good with it. And, and, we, and, and we interpret God's patience as affirmation. Israel did the same thing. They did the same thing. They didn't honor God and God alone. There were times when they served other gods where God was put on the shelf with other, with other gods who were not gods. And they say, well, God didn't destroy us. Uh, the exile was, was, not, was, a, was a warning, but God didn't destroy us. What did he do? He sent prophets. And, and by and large, they didn't listen to those prophets. And... and to obey, well, yeah, we'll add this to God. We'll add this to, to the law. We'll make our own laws, and we'll add it in. And God seems okay with that. He didn't destroy us. Uh, the sharing with other nations, well, we just kind of kept God to ourselves, and, and we didn't live in such a way that the nations would be drawn to us. So that, that just didn't happen. It's the problem of grace. It's the problem that, that we're given the impression that it's okay that we can get away with rejecting God and being our own authority. I like one quote. Uh, I, I can't remember the author who said it, but I, I, I love how he put it. He, he said, grace is unconditional and unlimited in scope, but not in duration. Grace is unconditional and unlimited in scope, but not in duration. There's a time when grace will run out. Uh, don't hear what I'm not saying. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm, 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 not saying this is a, I'm not saying this is salvation by works. I'm not saying this is you earn 
you earn it. But I am saying that, that, that you're a tenant in the vineyard and that God has a plan, that God has a desire for you as a tenant. And, and, and if you're just a tenant in the, vine, in the vineyard and you're living on your own authority, and you're not participating in the harvest. It goes, it go, it goes like this. It goes, it goes. I, I know, I know. I shouldn't click this. I know I shouldn't watch this. I, I know, I, I, I know. I've consumed too much. Again, I know I've said too much. Again, I know I've indulged too much. Again, but God's okay with it. But, but it's really, it's okay with God. He's, he's rather indifferent to it. And, and God's a God of grace, so I'm okay. And, and that's, that's take, his grace is there so that you will have time to change and to grow. He has a plan for you in the vineyard to be to be producing a harvest. He has plans, good plans for you to, to, to walk in. Good works prepared for you, Ephesians 2.10. And you're missing those. He's, he's like, you're not coming under my authority. You're doing your own, you're doing your own thing. Uh, and again, don't hear what I'm not saying. It's not, it's not that we're perfect or not that we need to be perfect. But it's the notion that God's indifferent. God doesn't, it doesn't matter to God how we live. That was the first mistake. Second mistake is this. Second mistake is they became immune to the voice of God. They became, they became immune to the voice of God. Here's, here's the problem. Here's the problem is when we repeatedly ignore and suppress God's voice. And that, that may be, that, that may be you're, you're reading a, a passage of scripture and, you, and something is just, wow, God has, has really nudged me. God has spoken to me in this way. It may be in a conversation. Somebody says something, you're like, that is exactly what I need to hear. That's almost like God is, is giving me that nudge. Maybe it's even in a, in a dream. I'm not saying all dreams are, are God. I mean, some dreams are dreams that you just ate, you just ate too much spicy food <laughs> the night before. Uh, so uh, don't hear what I'm not saying there, but maybe sometimes God does reveal something to you in a dream. However, God speaks to, to reject that voice. When you do that, you're building up resistance. You're, you're, you're building a resistance, you're, you're, you're building a wall. And, and resist that voice uh, over and over that it takes a stronger and stronger warning for God to get your attention. Ignore that voice long enough, then it becomes very, very hard to hear that voice over time. Build that wall high enough and, 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 and tall enough that you won't hear his, his voice. Repeatedly, here in the parable, the landowner sent servants to the tenants and they kept shutting them down. They kept, they kept getting rid of those servants. God sent prophets to Israel over and over and they just kept resisting. They kept nullifying the warnings. So they developed these blind spots. They stopped hearing God's voice. You can tell these religious leaders were so deaf, they didn't even realize initially this parable was about them. Yeah, uh, I, I just wonder, I, I just wonder, are, are, there, are there voices, are, is God speaking warning to you and you're just not listening? You're just, you're resisting that nudge. You're resisting that voice and, 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 and you're building a wall. I just wonder 
if that's you, how may God be bringing warnings to you? That's a hard question uh, to think about to think about here this morning. This is a heavy parable. Uh, I, I think of any any parable I've looked at, there is so much here. And so mistake number three. Mistake number three is they rejected the cornerstone. They rejected the cornerstone. They, the way people built back in those days, they largely built with stone. And, and, and the builders, they would look for this cornerstone when they're building because that would, that would set the direction of the building. And Jesus is saying, look, I am the cornerstone that you are rejecting. It's my authority, it's my teaching. And you're rejecting me. Back then, one of the ways of execution was stoning. We all know that, that, that one of the ways was stoning. But, but a variation on that was that they would, they would take this, this scaffolding and they would build this scaffolding up to about 12 feet. And they would take a person and, and they, would, they would push them off that scaffolding onto a, into a, a pit of rocks. And then that person would fall into that pit and, and, and he would be broken. He'd have broken bones. He would, he would fall into that pit and it would, it would break him. And, and, and he'd be limping around that pit, but sometimes, sometimes if he could get out of that pit, it, it would be healable. And, and Jesus is saying, look, I am that stone that you are rejecting. You're, you're rejecting me. I'm like a stone that you've fallen on. And, and, and your lives continue to fall on that stone. You know, some people would say, some people would say, um, Great. I, I really don't believe this. I mean, I understand what Jesus is, is saying, but I, I, don't, I don't believe it. And, 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 um, and, and perhaps because of his mercy and because of his grace, say, I'm free to say that. Um, and, and you can say that. And, and don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying this with any kind of arrogance. Um, he's still the stone, whether you believe it or not. Uh, that doesn't change. That doesn't change the reality of it. And, and, and just uh, would say this to you, that, that if that you recognize that we're living in a culture that so easily and so quickly rejects the claims of Jesus. And it rejects it without even considering it and without even looking at the evidence. And, and the stakes are high when you do that. And, and so I, I just ask you to not, not just default to to the to to culture but to actually think about the fact what if he really is the stone and what if he is the one these claims he's making about himself are true what if his authority is a good authority as he's been saying well there are three mistakes that israel makes there are three mistakes that we can make as well. Sum it up here. First one is they mistook the grace of God as indifference, as affirmation of how they're living. I, I, can, I can reject God, I can live how I want, and God's okay with it. I find the imagery here of, of the vineyard very helpful. That, that here we are, we're in the vineyard. We're a tenant in the vineyard, and, and, and we're there to produce fruit. And, and, and God's saying, I want to make you successful. I want to make you prosperous in the sense of producing fruit. He's saying, look, I've got, I've got good works. I've got things that I would love 
for you to be part of. But you're not coming under my authority. You're still your own authority. It's like you're wandering around a vineyard or an apple field and you're not helping with the harvest. You're just doing your own thing. God's saying, I've got, I've got blessing that I want to give to you and I want you to be a blessing to others, but you can't do that when you're not under my authority. I hope, I hope that makes sense. That, that's what really hits me. And then secondly, being, becoming immune to the voice of God. That, that keep rejecting his voice, building resistance, building that wall. And, and, and God's voice can become harder and harder to hear. If, if God is nudging you, if God is speaking to you, you can either receive it or, or you can build resistance. I would, I would just so encourage you today not to build resistance, to listen to the voice of God while you can hear it. And then thirdly, is, is, is not to reject him. Is not to reject his authority. His authority is a good authority. Coming under authority is a radical notion in today's culture. But it's a better authority than our authority. It's, it's a good authority. You know, I can, I can look back. I can look back on my warning. And I can look back now and I can see, you know, somebody gave me this warning. It, sure, it was his job to do, but but it was also a kind thing to do because, because that warning helped tell me that I needed to make a change. That, that if I kept doing what I was doing, something worse could happen. And so, and so this warning is given, it's an opportunity, it's an opportunity for a person to learn and to change. Jesus gives us a warning here because he knows that we're apt to misunderstand God's grace. That, that, it, that, that, we're, mis, that, that we're, we're misunderstanding God's grace as, as affirmation, as, as his okay, rather than his grace is giving us time. He knows that we're, that we're apt to stop listening to him speaking, to him nudging, to that still small voice. He knows that we're apt to reject his authority and, and go back to our own authority in ways. He knows we're apt to do these things. And so what does he do? He gives us warnings. And here in this parable, uh, it, is, it is a hugely uh, packed full parable of warnings. I'm thankful for those warnings. I, I hope this morning, as you process this teaching, as you look at it, that you'll feel the same way. So let's pray together. God, we thank you for uh, recording this amazing parable, this hard parable, these warnings that Jesus gave to the religious authorities, but warnings that are just as applicable for us. But thank you for for bringing us into your vineyard, for, for making us tenants and entrusting that work to the likes of us. God, help us to be in sync. Help us to be the ones who, who bring the harvest, who bring the fruit, who submit, surrender to your authority and so that our lives are, are unfolding in accordance to your
God. 